where uh, the Lieutenant Governor left off and start off by thanking the folks who I know worked so hard in the midterm elections uh, to make sure that our voices were heard at the ballot box and that now our voices are being heard um, in Washington, D.C. and in our state house and uh, without the like unprecedented enthusiasm, the engagement by people uh, who are building on some of the work that folks have been doing for so long. Um, I mean, without, without that, I wouldn't be standing here and we wouldn't be uh, moving forward and seeing the progress that we're already seeing. So uh, I feel like you all should give yourselves a round of applause for all the work I know you've been doing. <laughs> But um, I want to—I I just kind of want to update you on how things are going and what we've been seeing as a team, uh, you know, from the third district as a Democratic caucus, um, and how I think that that is going to impact us here on the ground in Kansas, and um, you know what what I see going forward. So, you know, I was sworn in not that long ago. You know, we're we're just a couple of months into. Uh, a Democratic majority, but um, I feel like we hit the ground running. You know, almost immediately we saw this amazing incoming class of um, of new representatives from all over the country. A lot of folks representing voices that have literally never been heard um, in in the in Congress, and um, you know, we got sworn into a shutdown government, and that was really painful for a lot of people who make use of the, of the services that the federal government um, that the, the federal government offers, but also for the people who work for the federal government, our committed civil service um, employees who go to work day in and day out because they're committed to the job of making sure that the American people and everyone in our country is being taken care of. And um, I got to talk to firsthand quite a few federal employees and, and people who are impacted, including ag the agricultural field um, and the folks who are contractors and own companies that were severely impacted. And I think that we owe a round of applause to the federal government workers who continue to work when they didn't know if they were gonna get paid or not. of that, that um, shutdown and, and everything that was going on with that, uh, the Democrats had to wait a little bit before we actually got to start talking about the kind of cornerstone of uh, what we hoped would be the, the new session, and that's uh, HR1, or the For the People Act. And that, yeah, it's, it's exciting. Please clap. Um, and the, the For the People Act, it touches on some of the core of what has been holding up progress in our country and in our government, and that's campaign finance reform and voting rights. And as Kansans, I think we know how important voting rights are and why we're so glad that Laura Kelly is our governor and not someone else. I feel like I could highlight a whole bunch of things, but recently I had the opportunity to meet with um, Alejandro Rangel Lopez, who I'm sure a lot of you know is the young person who's doing a bunch of work on Dodge City. And it's, oh, no, no, no. I wasn't sure if I was going to get to see We got to meet in D.C. And I, it was funny because I felt like, um, I'm going off script here, but that's okay. Uh, because the, I felt like the both of us were just like, 
It's so exciting to meet you. Um, you know, we're from different parts of the state, but but we're we're both just really excited about having the opportunity to um, have so many people coming together and moving toward the same the same goal, which is to make sure that everyone has access to the ballot box, making sure that every vote is counted, making sure that people are not being turned away for um, nefarious reasons. And so thank you for the work that you're doing, and I'm excited to watch what you do for our state as we move forward. So just so you know, I will be, um, I will be part of uh, HR1 uh, on the voting rights side of it. We're pulling together, we're putting together a portion of the bill that will that will do just that help ensure that every person's vote is counted because one of the things that we know especially as a state that had Chris Kobach as our Secretary of State that that oftentimes you you need to have a way to, to deal with uh, a person who's supposed to be looking out for your interests so we're pulling we're pulling together some um, some legislation that will make sure that if you have uh, an elections official, uh, whether it's a secretary of state or elections board that is um, interfering with your right to vote, that you can go directly to the Department of Justice. So we're working on that. We're going to make sure that let everybody know that we're doing it. So another another piece of. Um, progress that we're seeing is that just this week, we had the opportunity to vote on HR 8 and, and HR 1112. These are gun safety issues. And I had, I had the opportunity to serve with a woman who uh, I look to as just this, she's an amazing, strong um, advocate. And that's Lucy McBath. And she's been working for a really long time with the Moms Demand Action and Every Town and Students Demand Action and all the folks who are coming together, um, healthcare advocates, people who are coming together to make sure that we're really addressing this public, public health issue. This is a public health crisis. And I feel, one, like I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to do this, but I feel, like I am so fortunate to have cast a ballot to pass these two measures to to expand background checks and close loopholes that ins that will ensure that people who should not have access to firearms because they have a history of domestic violence or because they didn't pass their background check in the right amount of time that they're not able to do harm to other people or to do harm to the, to themselves. And we have seen that for too long, and we've seen inaction on the part of our on the part of our legislator, legislators for too long. And I feel, especially in light of the incident that happened yesterday in Mission, um, in the third district, there was uh, there was a, a shooting and an, an exchange between a guy and the police. And there are plenty of ways that we could have avoided avoided that exact incident. And now we are starting to see that because in the midterms we elected a Democratic majority in the House that we're, there will be movement. Thoughts and prayers are important, but movement and action are the thing that is going to make sure that we don't have to keep talking about this. Uh, economic 
um, economic issues and making sure that our economy is thriving are huge issues. And so, um, being on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee is something that I'm, I'm so excited about because this year, I think we're going to see movement on an infrastructure bill, and we're gonna see movement that will be in a bipartisan way. From what I can tell on this committee, this truly is, we're seeing, uh, this truly is a, a, a place where we can see people from across the aisle come together and make sure that we're solving issues and getting things done. That committee is committed to getting things done. Some of the things that I am particularly excited about having a chance to work on are ensuring ways that we're addressing and mitigating the effects of climate change when we think about how we develop our infrastructure. How are we thinking about our children and our grandchildren when we put together concepts and ideas and policies that are going to affect the way we get to where we're going, whether it's our job or school or where we're practicing our faith. When we do those things, we have to keep in mind that every time we build out a portion of our infrastructure or repair it, we have the opportunity to make sure that we're thinking about sustainability and we're thinking about the air that we're breathing and the water that we're drinking. And that is something that every single committee that is operating in Congress should be thinking about. I'm glad we have the select committee on climate change, but every committee has to be working on climate change and has to be working on sustainability. But 
I am so excited to tell you that yesterday I walked around and looked at the office that we're going to be opening in Wyandotte County. And we haven't had a congressional district office in Wyandotte County in close to a decade. And that's not okay. We, it, is, it is absolutely our responsibility as elected officials to make ourselves accessible to every part of our constituency. And this is my way to try to make that happen. Maybe you're thinking, what about the south part of the district? We're doing mobile office hours. We were out in Spring Hill last week because uh, we haven't had, we don't have a district office that far out south either. And we, as elected officials, have got to make sure that we're showing up and meeting people where they're at as much as we possibly can. So we're going to continue to do uh, mobile office hours in, in other parts of the district. We'll have a Wyandotte office and a Johnson County office. And this is going to be one of the things that we make sure we do to stay accessible and to stay available and to make sure that we continue to listen because I think that is exactly the reason that we got elected into this seat is because we are committed to listening and engaging as many people as possible. Regardless of whether they voted for me or they didn't, I still am responsible for representing them in Washington, D.C. So I'm going to close. I'm going to end soon because uh, get to the next thing. But uh, I'm just glad that the food is continuing to come out. No one's waiting for me to get done to eat. I've been to those things. Um, so, I want to spend the last couple of minutes that I'm here just kind of talking about the direction I see us moving. Earlier, when I came onto stage and I said, what a difference a year makes. Think back to just a year ago when we were trying to figure out who we had a primary. There were a couple of primaries, but we had a big primary in my district. And all of us were wondering, who's going to emerge from the 60-person six person primary in the Kansas 3rd? What are we going to, what's going to happen in the governor's race? And the things that I knew was happening, regardless of who came out of those races, was that we saw so many people getting engaged much earlier than they had ever been engaged in, in a campaign, uh, in politics and getting people registered to vote and knocking on doors and making phone calls and making contributions. All of these things were happening and the level of excitement that we saw was just phenomenal. And I think we're starting to see that again. When we look at what happened, how many, five days ago, I don't remember, I don't know what day it is. Just, just the other day, because, because Becky Fast Ran for, where is she? I'm sure she's here. <laughs> Ran for commission, county commission. We had a special election. And Jan Fateley, Jan? Jan Fateley ran in a special election. And won by like, with 80% of the vote. <laughs> Just the other day. It's a nonpartisan race, but they knocked on every door in that ward two times to get people out to vote. Two times they went over their list. And that, if that's not early engagement, I don't know what is. We're, we're months and months and months away from the nonpartisan elections that are coming up. But what we've got is this engaged voter or volunteer base. And it's amazing because if you think about it, the things that we did collectively that we did in the last election cycle, we're starting to see the building of something that in 2020 and 2022 and 2024 is going to affect the outcome of our Senate races, the out both Senate races, 2020, 2022, and we could have an outcome on the presidential race. We have the chance in Kansas 
to start to shift a national narrative about who runs for office, who wins elected, who wins elected office, who do we support? We literally, as Kansas, has have started to reset expectations. When when I'm out in D.C. and I'm talking to people about Kansas, they're not they're not looking at me funny anymore. <laughs> you guys did that. When I say, oh, I'm Sherry Davids, I'm from Kansas, they're like, oh, Kansas, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody knows about what happened here. Everybody knows about our, our governor and lieutenant governor and the third district, but not just that. They know that we help demonstrate what is possible. We have demonstrated what is possible. If you get active and engaged and organized, we can shift an entire narrative about the direction of our country. And if that's not... Everybody has their different ideas about who were great presidents and who wasn't. But a friend of mine was at, at an event and, and Bill Clinton was there. And he said, that Bill Clinton said, I have hope for our country after this midterm. Did you see what happened in Kansas? <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I think that's really interesting because I have always had faith in the people of Kansas. I have always known because of my own experience that Kansas believes in public education. Kansas believes in making sure that everybody has an opportunity to succeed. And Kansas believes in thinking about future generations. These are the things that I know that Kansans believe in. And now we have the opportunity to show that to everybody. Do we have issues? Yes. But that's why so many of the people in this room I know are going to be running for office soon. So that we can start doing stuff about those. with this, all of that hope and optimism and movement and building on what we've seen is going to require just as much work, if not more, than what we saw in the last year. And I know we can do it. I know, partly because of so many people being here, this is amazing. We can, we have the opportunity to encourage people to run. If you're sitting there and you're wondering whether or not you should run for office, do it. Do it. If you're sitting there wondering, how am I going to get involved? I don't want to run for office, so what should I do? Knock on doors. Make phone calls. And if you absolutely do not want to talk to people, I totally understand. There are so many other things you can do. In fact, I was noticing on our tables, that there are campaign workshops coming up. I haven't fully read through every single detail, but I'd encourage you to please just get involved. It can be phone calls, it can be knocking on doors, it can be running for office, it can be, I'm so busy, but I can write a $50 check, or a $500 check, or whatever, whatever amount. Those things matter so much. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be wealthy to be able to contribute to a campaign because $5 absolutely makes a difference. We raised millions of dollars on my campaign and our average contribution was just under $40. And that's a lot of And what I lacked in my own personal wealth, tons of people made up for. And that's what democracy is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the voices of a lot of people, not just a lot of money. So, we can come together and we can support our candidates and we can support each other. And I'm excited to help support all of the movement that's gonna be happening in these nonpartisan elections and in the 2020 elections. Um, please, please, please. Run for office. I don't have too much else to say except that I very much appreciate 
the work and the effort of all of the people who helped make sure that we won um, our governor's race and that we won this third district race. And I'm looking forward to watching us win so many more races over the future um, and to making sure that every year that we come back and do this, it's just a little bit bigger. We'll see you next year.